From not enough vaccines to go around to too many to use up, the new problem some counties are facing and what it might mean for you. Plus, will Kansas finally legalize marijuana? The fight continues. And veto times three. A busy week for the governor setting up a busy veto session next month. That's what we're talking about right now on Kansas Week. I'm Pilar Pedraza and this is Kansas Week. That veto number going up even as we're getting ready to record this show. The governor vetoing several controversial bills. We're going to look first at three aimed at your child's schools and sports opportunities. Governor Laura Kelly first vetoed a bill that would have banned transgender athletes from playing girls and women's sports at Kansas schools. You may remember dozens of Kansans came out in the middle of the pandemic to testify last February, both for and against the bill. Opponents called the bill openly discriminatory and a way for state legislators to bully transgender kids legally. The State High School Activities Association says there are just five transgender students in Kansas competing right now. Senator Renee Erickson of Wichita sponsored the bill. She says it protects women and girls from losing the advantages that come with playing women's sports, like access to scholarships, to physically bigger and stronger men. She told me shortly after the veto, she fully intends to pursue a veto override. Um, we were prepared for the veto, so mm -hmm. we will proceed full steam ahead with um, trying to get the numbers to override it. Even if we don't succeed this year, which I am hopeful we will, we will keep bringing it back because it's the right thing to do. I know this is strong language, but the end result, the impact on these kids is horrible. Uh, and we're going to work as hard as we have to to help the governor sustain this veto. The bill did not get enough yes votes for a veto override when it passed the first time. The same day, the governor vetoed two other controversial education bills. One would have required Kansas high schoolers to pass a civics test to graduate. The other ordered public schools to offer an NRA-developed firearms safety course. The State Board of Education members last week asked the governor for the veto, saying it's their elected job to determine curriculum requirements for Kansas students, not state lawmakers. And then on Friday afternoon, shortly before we started recording this show, the governor vetoing four more bills, one that would change limits on advanced balloting, putting more in place, another one that requires the legislature to fill statewide elected offices vacated early, that traditionally being the governor's job. The third bill would have lowered the concealed carry age to 18, as well as uh, re recognizing such lowered uh, concealed carry permits from other states. And the final one would have created a Gadsden flag license plate that you would have had to pay extra money for, that money going to the Kansas Rifle Association. A lot to break out of that, and here to help me do that, we have two guests on set. Quick note, <laughs> all of us have been vaccinated, fully vaccinated, and passed that two-week point, which is why we can all be here today. Together, joining me is State Representative Stephen Owens, Republican from Heston, and State Representative John Carmichael, Democrat from Wichita. Thank you both so much. Glad to be here. Always a pleasure. <laughs> and we're going to start off. That's like seven vetoes. Mm -hmm. How many of them end up coming up again with an attempt to override when we go back in May? Stephen, I'll start with you. I think the majority, in, uh, in, and uh, it's my hope that the governor's pen runs out of ink sometime soon mm -hmm. because there's a lot of good legislation that she's vetoing that does a lot of great things for our state. So uh, I could see, especially um, Second Amendment bills, for example, uh, some of those amendments passed with bipartisan support, bringing over a number of Democrats to support the Republican majority. So I could see that coming up. I could see the Save Girl Sports. You know, there's so many important things that have gone on in the legislature that uh, that she disagrees with, but I think the majority won't. John? Well, obviously, I see it very differently <laughs> than my friend Steve. And who is surprised by that? <laughs> I, 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 it should come as no surprise to anyone. But I think of the seven vetoed bills, there will probably be attempts made to override all of those. The only uh, veto that I think the governor might have difficulty with uh, concerns the appointment uh, to fill slots for state officers who've resigned. Uh, but I think the rest of those, that there's a solid uh, number, at least in the House, 
to sustain the governor's vetoes. Now, as to whether or not it's good legislation, if you think bullying transgender kids is good, if you think teenagers carrying concealed firearms is good, if you think license tags that honor slave traders with the money going to the Kansas Rifle Association, if you think those are good ideas, then we have some real disagreements. Steve. Well, I do think protecting our young women and their ability to uh, fairly compete in sports is really important. And I even believe our freedom of speech and ability to share that flag uh, is an incredibly uh, important part of what our country was founded on. But that so, doesn't have anything to do with freedom of speech. If you want to put a Gadsden flag on the bumper of your car, I'll defend your right to do that, even though I think it's a really stupid thing to do. But if you want the state of Kansas to put the Gadsden flag on a state license tag, that's a completely different matter. Is it still matter. not the individual's choice to purchase that flag? State's not forcing them to do it? It represents state sanction of a slave trader. It's yeah. wrong. I'm going to jump in here real quick. <laughs> the reason the governor cited for vetoing that particular bill is that it would be the first time that a state license plate with special funds where the money would go to support a political organization as opposed to a charity. And it's also interesting to note that the carrier of that bill in the Senate, Senator Clays, was the recipient of $1,000 in campaign contributions last cycle from the Kansas State Rifle Association. Well, um, Payback is what is Which is, is interesting. About. I'm a board member of the Kansas State Rifle Association mm -hmm. and absolutely fully support our uh, Second Amendment rights. And, and as especially as it relates to our 18 to 20 year olds, you know, I shared a story uh, where my doctor, my daughter at 20 years old, was uh, nearly abducted here in Wichita at a gas station. And be danged if she couldn't carry her firearm to protect herself from a, a male that is trying to abduct her. Try getting that call at 11.45 at night yeah, I never and being did. 30 minutes away. I never did understand why she called you 30 minutes away instead of simply dialing 911. She dialed 911 and called me next. When a police officer could have been there immediately. Done deal, uh, buddy. But putting, putting guns in the hands of teenagers is dangerous. Uh, well, show me one time where they've been licensed and then they go on to commit the crime, John. Well, in fact, in fact, I believe one of the arguments I'm going to jump in here real quick during debate was that it's already legal for teenagers mm -hmm. to carry open carry, just not concealed mm -hmm. carry. And at least with concealed carry, there is a training element involved. That's exactly right. And and, uh, you know, the concern, right? If you're carrying concealed, that's personal knowledge. You're there to protect yourself. If you want us to promote putting that out in the open and having our 18 and 20 year olds carry those in, out in the open, uh, I don't think that's necessarily going to be the best move for society. But if that's what needs to happen for my daughter and other people's daughters to protect themselves, that's what we'll do. We have a real problem with guns in this society and particularly in this community. I, not a day goes by for which there isn't a murder or an aggravated battery committed oftentimes based on the spur of the moment passion but because a gun was right there and available. And at some point we're going to have to realize that the Second Amendment requires responsibility just like I can't yell fire in a crowded theater and say I'm protected by the First Amendment. We should not be putting guns in the hands of teenagers. I'm going to add one thought to that, and then we're going to move on to something a little more uh, agreeable that we can all agree on. <laughs> and that is, I have had several conversations with the Wichita Chief of Police, very concerned about the recent rise in gun violence mm -hmm. among youth in the city. So uh, definitely some Had the concerns same conversation there. with him twice in the last two weeks. And were those uh, individuals licensed, trained, permitted to carry that firearm? Highly unlikely. All right, and we're going to leave that there. <laughs> so one thing that we can't all agree on, a bill that the governor signed that we have been talking a lot about a lot on this show, as well as over on Cake News, which is changes to the state's suspended license program. Yes. And uh, it is one that has had definitely bipartisan support, makes some uh, pretty big changes. And I know, Stephen, you were part of pushing that as part of the Criminal Justice Reform Committee. Yeah, I've had the, uh, the, the great opportunity to, to work with the Criminal Justice Reform Commission and put forth legislation. Now, this wasn't specifically derived from that, but it's a piece of it, right? Mm -hmm. It's making sure that those people that have made a mistake in the past aren't truly inhibited from being able to get gainful employment. I mean, that's what we're talking about. They have fines and fees and responsibilities to their family. And while suspended drivers license is certainly a tool in the tool belt. We need to make sure that people are enabled to be able to get that back and to get on with life. And certainly uh, you and I, John, have had conversations about this kind of being a form of a poverty tax, really, because it does 
you tend can't you, you, those who have you less can't money. afford to pay your fine then you get your driver's license suspended then theoretically you're not going to be able to drive to work anymore and you'll never be able to pay your fine or the reinstatement charge this is good legislation steve and Agreed. i agree on that <laughs> absolutely what remains undone is dealing with our archaic and ineffectual dui laws uh, the kansas judicial council spent two years developing a well-crafted uh, proposal. It passed, as I recall, virtually unanimously in committee, uh, passed with large margin on the House floor, and the Senate Judiciary Committee just kicked it aside and didn't do anything with it. Uh, that's disappointing. Wow. Well, in, just to be clear, the provisions in the suspended driver's license bill that we're talking about would eliminate the 90-day waiting period once fines and fees are paid off before you can apply for your reinstated license. Uh, that's only if the original suspension is because of uh, uh, traffic citations. Correct, yeah. yeah. And then it also creates a, kind of a provisional license for people mm -hmm. to be able to get to and from work uh, during yeah. that period. Even during a period of suspension, that's yep. what's mm -hmm. important. That's yeah. very important. It expands the eligibility for that uh, restricted license. All right, well, other things to talk about because it is going to be a very busy veto session. But this last week, we saw a date important to marijuana advocates, April 20th. And while the drug is not legal in Kansas right now, that could still change when the legislature goes back in May, as Alec Gartner from KSN's Capitol Bureau shows us. After years of delay, lawmakers recently moved forward with a bill that would allow edible medical marijuana. While smoking would not be allowed, marijuana advocates are happy to see something happening. I'm excited where we're at today, and I, I think it's, um, whether it passes this year or not, I think we've made huge strides in Kansas, and I, and I know it's coming. But not all lawmakers agree. This is about the marijuana industry pushing to be able to make money off of Kansas. Burlington Representative and Coffee County Sheriff's Deputy Eric Smith is speaking out against the bill. He says certain people should be able to use medical marijuana, but he believes the proposal needs to be tightened up so that only people that really need it can get it. This bill goes way beyond that and opens it up more or less to recreational marijuana if you can come up with an excuse and call it medical. Others say it will help people hurting. I don't think anybody is going to get through this bill and, and get everything they want. Um, and I say that on both sides of this issue, uh, and I hope that people continue to have faith that you know, we are working in good faith to try and get to a agreeable compromise that we can all live with. Though it seems unlikely for the bill to make it all the way to the governor's desk this year, lawmakers have yet to decide whether they will take a vote on it next month. But either way, advocates are pleased with the progress. Reporting at the Capitol, I'm Alec Gartner. So this bill got a lot of talk when it, the House Fed and State Committee finally voted out of committee, but then the House sent it back to committee. Mm -hmm. So, and that's where it sits right now. Put your prognostication hats on. <laughs> and do we see it come back out of committee? Does the House get a vote on it? John, I'll start with you this time. Well, I think you'd really have to ask the speaker. <laughs> He's the one who sent it back to committee. Uh, he found something wrong with it. I don't know what it is. Maybe Steve has some insight because I can't divine why in the world we haven't long ago had a vote on medical marijuana in Kansas. I think that there were a lot of people that had voices that wanted to be heard. There was a number of people still sitting on amendments that they wanted to have their opportunity to hear. Uh, and in the interest of time, decisions were made to kind of speed that process up and kind of per se call the question and vote it out. And I think what happened is we saw those people that, that didn't feel like the committee process worked the way that it needed to work, um, convince leadership to send it back into committee for further conversation. Again, whether it'll come out during the veto session, I think is to be determined. Uh, I, as I understand, they, they're, they are seriously considering continuing to working, work on it at least during the veto session. But remember, every bill that's introduced this year, still there for next year. Yeah. So we'll see what happens. Well, and I find it interesting that there were those who felt enough time wasn't spent in committee on this because most bills, they get maybe two days of hearings. This bill got several days of hearings and then several days, I think yeah. it was being discussed for a couple of weeks in committee. Well, this is a very passionate issue for a lot of people, right? Whether you're for it or against it or somewhere in the middle, it's a very passionate issue uh, on both sides. Mm -hmm. and, and for people like myself that feels that there should be a very narrow, tailored approach to your doctor and your pharmacist being involved in this process uh, versus what came out of committee, which is a marijuana, you know, recreational light bill is what they called it by the time I said. A lot of people don't have the stomach for a recreational marijuana bill. 
Interesting. I see it differently, of course. <laughs> uh, Kansas is one of only three states in the nation that now does not have legal medical marijuana. And those states are not falling into poverty and disaster and dismay. It's working fine. It's just one more example of why people look at Kansas and they think we're behind the times here. Uh, so it's long overdue for us to legalize medical marijuana and it's time for us to look seriously at legalizing adult use marijuana as well. Well, there is another issue that Kansas is now in the minority for not having moved forward on and the governor has spent much of the last week pushing for it. That's Medicaid expansion. She's not alone. Healthcare advocates renewed their push for expanded Medicaid in Kansas this week after a new report showed benefits for Kansas businesses. The Alliance for a Healthy Kansas held a virtual meeting Wednesday to go over key findings from a Kansas Health Institute report. That report shows private sector employers would save between $39.6 million and $80.6 million a year if Kansas opted in to Medicaid expansion. Currently, Kansas is one of just 12 states that have not yet opted into Medicaid Medicaid expansion. Opponents in the legislature argue it's an investment the state simply can't afford right now. The KHI report also says Medicaid expansion would lead to an improved ability to work and minimal impact on the labor market, and that nearly all Kansas industries employ Kansans eligible for expanded Medicaid benefits. And uh, lots of talk about this, but uh, Stephen, I'm going to talk. Start with you. Anything in this study that, from your perspective, might improve the chances of Medicaid expansion happening in the state? No, not at all. Uh, the, the reality is the people spoke very clearly um, with this last election cycle, and a number of the moderate Republicans that were very supportive of this were were uh, removed from office, and more conservatives were put in their place, and that and that that further diminished the chance of Medicaid expansion being created. Look, we believe in a hand up, not a handout. And ultimately, the way that, that this legislation is introduced and currently presented, there is no motivation for somebody to, um, to get off of it. When you're applying this to 19 to 16 year, year old able-bodied individuals, the idea that, that there, there's got to be some mechanism. I mean, even my homeless shelter back in, in Newton doesn't let you stay there indefinitely for free. You've got to be making strides to get off of the, the free handout. There's none of that in this legislation. And I think until we see some of that change on some level, I don't think Medicaid expansion has a chance. John? My, my friend Steve comes from a very different world where there must be some alternative reality. We have foregone $4.7 billion as of today, $4.73 billion as of today uh, in federal funds. Uh, that would have supported Medicaid expansion. Now we have a study that says it's costing Kansas businesses $80 million a year. And Steve thinks that the voters have spoken? No, what happened is in Republican primaries, moderate Republicans were taken out by the hardcore right-wingers. And as a result, leadership in the House and the Senate will not even allow us to have a debate, much less a vote on Medicaid expansion. If we did, it would pass by large majorities, be signed by the governor, and we'd have 150,000 Kansans insured today that as of now are doing without health insurance. It's preposterous. I think the people spoke. They spoke in the primary and they spoke in the general. And it was very clear that all of those uh, campaigned against uh, Medicaid expansion. Look, it was very clear that you took out some Republican moderates on a number of issues, but that does not represent a we, mandate from the voters at all. Out. Well, we could talk about mandates from the voters. That'd be kind of funny. I think that it's, uh, I think that it, uh, quite to the contrary, it's very clear. Medicaid expansion has been a decisive issue, and those people uh, recognize the value that, for example, our community uh, health centers play. Uh, you know, anything from uh, health ministries up in Newton that provides those health care services, regardless of your ability to pay, um, that takes a lot of the burden off, even with dental, mental health, uh, family physician needs. We have a ton of resources where the focus needs to be put on. And for those people that need to qualify or need that help up I totally agree with it but we have got to put a mechanism in place where people can get off of the public dime and find their own services eventually and without that we create a, another um, statewide handout another program 
that is going to benefit uh, the able-bodied. And I think that, that, that that is just not what our values stand for in this state. And speaking of uh, public support for it, the Kansas Speaks survey has pretty consistently shown that at least 60 plus percent of Kansans support Medicaid expansion. Other surveys have shown that number above 70 percent. It's really interesting, though, depending on how the question's asked, I suppose, because I polled my district and I've got the proof to show exactly where my district stands on that. Uh, and, and the question was very clear. Do you support taxpayer-funded health care for the indigent? Well, you know, that's not a scientific poll, Steve. Well, and that's right. part of the problem is that What's your folks poll, are, say, that folks, well, we just heard what Kansas speaks, what well, Port Hayes State district, University. John? What's your poll? I don't go out and conduct meaningless, unscientific polls. You don't talk to so your that constituents could, so about what I, they want, John? I talk to my constituents, Steve, but I don't go out running bogus polls so that I can show up on Kansas Week and feed people baloney. Bogus polls? 8,455 surveys sent out to every registered voter mm -hmm. in my district, every home, Republican, mm -hmm. Democrat, and Independent, mm -hmm. and still the majority says no to Medicaid expansion. And if expansion. you understood anything about polling, you would recognize that those types of polls are not statistically valid. Well, I guess when they don't we're, suit your purposes, they wouldn't be, would right they, John? We're going to leave that right there, guys, because we got one other highly contentious uh, topic to hit COVID vaccinations, which I'm sure you guys will be willing to take opposing sides on in a few minutes. This week, the state health department's website showed more than half of Kansas counties actually turned down COVID vaccines, even though they're far from herd immunity. Cakesbury Smith asked county health departments why. It's just my duty, my obligation to get the vaccine, so I did. A slower stream of people coming and going from the old public library in downtown Wichita. Fewer community members are getting vaccinated for COVID-19. I just had to persuade my son that this is the responsible thing to do. Less than 40% of Kansans are protected against the coronavirus. Data from the Kansas Department of Health and Environment website shows more than 60 Kansas counties didn't need additional doses this week. Mostly in rural settings, including Pratt, Stafford, and Kiowa counties. We've met the demand. Um, just because we're a smaller community doesn't mean that we haven't seen people who ha have come from larger communities who maybe work here or, or are a relative of somebody who lives here. Carrie Ulrich is the administrator for the Kiowa County Health Department. She says they've given out about 1,500 total doses so far, but it's all about balance. We still have vaccine in our free and so if we were to um, not accept doses, it's because we're trying to utilize those doses in areas that have a greater need. People in Wichita are worried Kansas will never reach herd immunity. I'd like to see that everybody get vaccinated. That way we can go back to, you know, living life how it's supposed to be. That'd be pretty cool. You know? Yeah, I just don't see it happening anytime soon. And given the vaccine doubts and hesitancy I've heard from Kansans over the last uh, several weeks, couple of months, this news really not too surprising for me. What about you guys? It's not surprising to me. We had a president who poo-pooed the science, who poo-pooed masks, who, who did all sorts of things to try to make people think that COVID is a hoax and that it would just miraculously go away someday. And unfortunately, some people bought that. Then we've also got a contingent of people who are known as the anti-vaxxers who look at studies that are not valid at all and anecdotal reports and blow them up so that some people actually think that the vaccine contains a chip that will allow the government to track you. And people who don't take that vaccine are not only putting their lives at risk, their families' lives at risk, but the society as a whole, because in order to defeat this uh, disease, we're going to have to acquire what is referred to as herd Im immunity. And we can't do that at 35 to 40 or even 60% vaccination rates. More people are probably going to end up dying because of another surge before folks realize that this is real. And I have spoken with hospital CEOs that say that the cases they're seeing coming into the hospital now and into the ICU in particular are folks who have not been vaccinated. And the beautiful part about our country is that thing called freedom and choice and our ability to decide what we put in our body. 
Uh, I almost said that I agreed with John, but the reality is I don't, and that doesn't surprise anybody <laughs> because I firmly believe that that should be a choice, right? If I choose not to get vaccinated uh, and I ultimately catch COVID, then I have to deal with those consequences. Somebody else chooses not to get vaccinated that comes in contact with me and I'm not vaccinated and I give it to them. They chose not to get vaccinated for whatever reason that was. But see, we Steve have and choice I agree and on liberty that. and freedom in this Steve country. And I, and it seems Steve, over the last year, we seem to have forgotten that. Steve and I agree on that. Nobody should be forced to take a vaccine that is on emergency use authorization. And I don't think anyone is proposing that. But as a matter of responsibility to your neighbors, to your friends, to the people you work with and your society, you need to take the vaccine. And I would say, except for when they have the ability to take the vaccine themselves. It's fully available to everybody in every age range, 16 or older. So if my neighbor wants to take it, if my community wants to take it and I choose not to take it, then that is completely my choice as it is their choice. And that's what, no, allow that's what allows for a mutation of the virus. And that's why that theory doesn't work. If you leave a number of people out there unvaccinated, the virus will mutate and then it will attack those of us who have done our civic duty and taken the vaccine. Well, a lot of the hesitancy that we're seeing it c comes back to a lot of the uh, false ideas, uh, myths that we're seeing circulating and rumors about the vaccine, mm -hmm. folks worried about it, you know, like the chip concept. I've been hearing that one a lot. Mm -hmm. And the governor has been saying, it's not government telling you that it's not there that's going to do any good. It's got to be your local, you know, your next door neighbor, your pastor, those folks who are really going to make the difference there. It's not going to occur because of a government mandate. It's going to occur because of what the governor says, uh, people convincing other people it's the right thing to do like I'm trying to do right now. I'm trying to convince people it's the right thing to do for your friends and your neighbors. Uh, but we can't leave a large unvaccinated population out there and expect to ever get control of this disease. You know, I think that uh, at the end of the day, this is this is choice and consequence. We each have our uh, I'll go back to it again. It's freedom and it's liberty. And over this last year, we've seen so much of that thrown out of the way uh, because of a pandemic, because of government overreach, because of a whole slew of other things. And that needs to change. There's I'm not going to sit here and advocate that people have to get it. If you want to get it, I encourage you to get it. If you don't want to get it, I encourage you not to get it. That is completely your choice that you need to make with yourself, your family, and with your children. All right. <laughs> well, we're going to leave that there. Thank you, gentlemen, so much for some very interesting <laughs> conversations Well, I knew here. it would be fun when you put Steve and I yeah. next to each it's other. It's always a good <laughs> time. We, we have right. frank and candid discussions. Yes, we, we do. do. We Absolutely. Here, and I greatly appreciate it. And I <laughs> uh, can't wait to have you both on again. Look forward and to it. And we hope that you also have enjoyed our discussion here today. We would like to extend our thanks as well to Cake News, the Wichita Eagle, and KSN News for sharing their materials with us. We'd love to hear what you think. Reach out and continue. Continue the conversation with us on social media. Just look for Pilar Pedraza TV or PBS Kansas on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram and we'll be sure to respond. For now, stay safe and have a great week. <laughs>